All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the lecture on generative art with processing. So in the previous lecture, um, we introduced some general concepts and definitions about generative and interactive art. Uh, and in this lecture, we're going to develop a simple piece of generative visual art using the processing uh, environment. And processing, uh, which we're going to be using, is an environment that was developed in order to enable people to learn about creative coding um, for multimedia and other applications. So it's a really, really good place to um, start to experiment um, with these kinds of things. And I've opened the processing application here, and I've, I've already written in a few comments. And so that's the first thing that we can note, is that anything um, that appears after these two slashes to the end of a line is what we call a comment. And that means that it's something that we can read, but it's something which um, processing, the programming language we're going to be using, pays no attention to. So often it's useful to add these comments um, as we work to remind us what something means or to tell other people what something means or so on and so forth. So you're going to be see me using comments a little bit as we, as we go through this exercise um, today. So first things first, I strongly recommend that you start with a blank slate. Um, with a, a program that works, but which does almost nothing at all. And for processing, that program is going to look like this. So I'm going to type it out, and then I'm going to talk about it. And that's it. Um, and I'm, I'm going to press the play button now to make this go. So here I go. And when I do that, a little window with a, a, a blank square canvas pops up, and that's it. Um, and this might not seem like much, but I think it's really, really great, because we have just started working, and already we have some confirmation that what we are doing um, is, in some sense, correct. Um, and what we really, really, really need to do as we develop a generative visual art piece like this using processing is to make little changes and then hit the play button, make little changes, hit the play button so that we have this quick feedback loop where um, we're constantly seeing the state of our work. Um, and this approach is really the opposite approach to another approach that some of you might be tempted to take, which is to make an elaborate plan, an elaborate and ambitious plan and then spend a long time sort of developing that thing without looking at it, without confirming that what you have is working, and then trying to get it work. And that way of working is, is going to be much, much more frustrating. Um, and because it doesn't involve as many cycles of feedback, um, might also lead to less aesthetically interesting results. So this little blank program that we've got, we've run, it's great because it works. So I'm going to stop it. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about this um, very simple program. Up here we have the setup function and everything that we put between these curly braces is going to be a series of instructions that happen only once when we first start the thing. While everything that we put down here in the draw function between these curly braces is going to be a series of instructions that happen repeatedly every time the software redraws the screen. This software processing is really meant for, for what we would call generative animation. So what we're doing is constantly drawing and redrawing the screen. So let's um, go down here in the draw function and put an instruction. Like, how about the instruction ellipse? Um, and now I'm going to run that. And 
and we see um, a circle or an ellipse drawn in the middle of this little canvas. So let's talk a little bit about the relationship between the numbers we see here and what we see on the canvas. So the meaning of these numbers in our ellipse instruction here, the first one is the x position and the second one is the y position, the vertical position or the middle of the circle or ellipse. And then the last two numbers are the width and height of the ellipse. So if we stop that and change this width number to 50 and then rerun it, now we'll see that the ellipse has gotten wider. And if we change the height to 100, now the ellipse has gotten taller. And if I change this 50 to 0 here, the ellipse will move over to the left. If I change it to 100, it's going to move all the way to the right. There we go. And if I change it to 0 here, the y position moved up, see? So from everything that we saw there, we can um, make some inferences about how this geometry works. Um, in the x axis, as we're going from 0 to 100, with 0 on the left and 100 on the right. In the y axis, we're going from 0 at the top to 100 at the bottom. And then our width and height are also um, in the same units. And so, and we also saw that our canvas here was 100 units wide and 100 units high. So if we want to change that, um, we can use the size instruction. Let's make a 400 by 300 pixel canvas, so it'll have a 4 over 3 um, aspect ratio. And now my canvas has gotten a lot bigger, uh, and my ellipse is kind of up in a up in a in a different corner than it used to be. Um, <clears throat> let's put the ellipse in the center of this 400 by 300 canvas. So if the canvas is 400 pixels wide, then the center would be at 200 pixels in the x-axis. And if the canvas is 300 pixels high, then the center would be at 150 pixels. And let's make it a nice little circle again. There we go. So now we have a, center, a circled cent we have, Now we've changed the canvas size and put our um, done a little bit of thinking to put our circle in the center uh, of the canvas. Um, and in the tutorials, this kind of drawing thing, um, you develop it by doing an exercise um, of where you try to draw your name using lines and ellipses and so on and so forth, um, which is a very good exercise for thinking about how this geometry works. Uh, but I don't want to do that now, I want to press ahead. So let's um, start to work with some color. So once, when the program first starts, let's change the color mode to be HSB, which is really just the same thing as HSV, and for the, our colors to be numbers from 0 to 100. So this is really HSV with um, colors from 0 to 100. So having done that now, once, when the thing first starts, every time I draw the frame, um, I can set a color. So let's set the fill color for the ellipse, which is the color inside the ellipse. Um, and we're setting this in HSV, so our first thing is a hue. Uh, let's make a green ellipse, so that would be about a third of the way to 100, a third of the way around the color wheel. Um, and let's make our ellipse a fully saturated color, like a rainbow color, so 100. And let's make it full brightness, so 100. Now, when I run it, I should have a green ellipse. Ta-da! So, so far, everything about our program is fixed. Um, so, although we're making this little piece of visual art in a generative way because we're specifying some rules, 
these rules um, really aren't very interesting. We could have just drawn this image in a, in a vector drawing program or something like that. So let's start to do some things that we couldn't do with a vector drawing program. Um, what if we wanted the color to be random every time the ellipse was drawn? Um, the hue, or the first value of the color here, instead of it being um, green, what if we make it a random number between 0 and 100 each time around? And to make this easier to see, I'm going to make our ellipse somewhat larger. And let's go. And now we have something that is flickering as its color is randomly changed. Well, what if we kept the same hue, just taking this in a slightly different direction, kept it green, but made it random saturations between 0 and 100, and random brightnesses between 0 and 100. Now it's, it's definitively green, uh, but it still has that dynamic, flickery behavior that we saw in the iteration previous to this. And I just want to call your attention again to the speed with which we're doing these iterations. I'm making one little change at a time, and then I'm trying it again, and then making another little change, and then I'm trying it again. And so one of the things that's happening when I do that is that I'm, I'm getting aesthetic feedback about what I'm doing. And I can use that feedback, I can, I can use the provocation of the results that I'm getting from the computer to gradually lead me to more interesting results. Well, what if we put the ellipse at a different place every frame? What if instead of the ellipse being at the center of the screen, it was at a random location anywhere along the x-axis, so from 0 to 400, and a random location anywhere along the y-axis, so from 0 to 300, but always the same size. And it's always going to be this random green color as well. What's that going to look like? Only one way to find out, to run it. Whoa! And now I think it starts to get interesting. Um, it's like this interesting, dynamic, um, animated texture of different green circles. So it has some dynamic behavior. It's changing in front of us. It never looks the same from one moment to the other. But at the same time, it also has an identity. It has things about it that are fixed that are really the result of our creative decisions, such as the decision to work with this ellipse and the decision to work with this green um, color space. I, I want to try this on a larger canvas. So I'm going to change the canvas size to 800 by 600. And I'm going to change my random generation of the x, of the x position of the ellipse to go between 0 and 800. And same thing for the y position. And I'm going to see what that looks like. Well, kind of the same. What would it look like if I made the ellipses really thin? So here, here's the width of the ellipse, the fourth parameter. I wonder if I change that to just 10 pixels instead of 100 pixels. Now they kind of look like eyes or maybe raindrops. It's quite a different effect, especially as they pile up. And this makes me think, what would it be like if I made this more subtle by making the ellipses darker? What if the brightness value, the third parameter of our HSV color model, instead of being a random number from 0 to 100, what if it was a random number from 0 to 30, which is really not very bright? What would that look like? Still looks green, 
um, but also kind of black as well because of all of those dark colors. What if I wanted it to be um, a dark green, but not so dark that it was black? How would I go about that? This expression, random 30, is giving us, here I'll think about it down here, this expression random 30 is giving us a number between 0 and 30. So if I was to add something to that, like if I was to have the expression random 30 plus 40, that would give us a number between um, 40 and 70, because when this gave us a 0 and we added 40 to that, it would be 40. And when this gave us a 30 and we added 40 to that, it would give us a 70. And let's say this gave us a 15, we add 40 to that, it would give us 55. So we can change the range of these random numbers that we're generating uh, by adding adding an offset to them. So let's just do exactly that. Let's add 40. So everything is going to be somewhat brighter, uh, but not the maximum brightness. Now I've lost count of how many iterations I've made now with this piece. Um, maybe I've um, maybe I've tried it 13 or 14 or 15 times um, in the space of, of 20 minutes. Uh, and that's exactly where I want to be when I'm making these visual art pieces and processing. This type of programming where you're making simple changes and then trying it and then making a simple change and then trying it and then making a simple change and then trying it is sometimes called bricolage programming, uh, which is an idea we'll probably come back to in a later lecture. So this piece is definitely a piece of generative art. Um, we have set up a system where there's really uh, four or so rules um, in effect. And then we press play and the rules go into effect. And the actual drawing, the actual surface of the artwork that we see is the consequence of these rules that we've made. So it's like we are making the piece at one step removed. We're not directly drawing, we're making rules that describe the drawing, and then someone or something else is doing the drawing for us. So that's definitely uh, a generative art thing that's happening. And something that happens often in generative art, and which it's worth reflecting on, is that we get this phenomena called emergence. I'll type that word out for you there. And emergence is the idea that we can have systems where the result we get from them seems to be more or somehow different than what we would expect from the rules. And so we're, I think we're seeing a little bit of emergence here. Our rules just say draw an ellipse with a random color, and that's what's happening. And yet when we look at it, what we get is this uh, very specific, complicated texture um, that in some sense it's hard to relate to the simplicity of these rules. It's like the whole here is more than the sum of its parts. So anytime we find ourselves describing something, a uh, result as you know, somehow surprising or somehow exceeding what we put into the thing, it's a good sign that we're dealing um, with emergence, which is a common property of generative, generative systems. But what if we wanted to make this piece interactive? instead. Um, there's lots of ways that we could do that. I think one nice way to do that would be to make a piece where when we click it restarts. And so to do that I'm going to make a new function called mouse clicked and everything between the curly braces is going to be instructions that happen only in the moment after we click the mouse. And let's make uh, that what happens there um, be that the screen uh, is cleared to some color. So let's let's make it um, black, 
by picking a hue of zero, a saturation of zero, and a brightness of zero. That black. I'll put a comment up here. This is a shade of green. And let's fill the whole screen using the rect instruction for rectangle. And for, with the rect instruction, the um, arguments or the numbers, the parameters that come after this bracket here are the left and top of the rectangle and then the width and height of the rectangle. So for left and top, let's go with zero by zero, which is the top left corner of the screen. And for width and height, let's make it our whole canvas, which we said was 800 by 600 pixels high. Now let's test that because every time we make a change, however simple, we should test it. So now my piece is running and when I click, we start over again um, from a black screen. This green shade um, pops out nicer against the black background. Probably we should have put a black background in um, earlier. Now I'm going to run this again, just show you a, a nuance or a detail of this. When we run this piece, at first we don't have the black background, and then when we click we get a black background, and from this moment on, every time we click, we have a black background. So that suggests to me that it would be more elegant if our piece had that black background from the beginning. So I'm going to do that up here. Right after I've changed the color mode to HSV, I'm going to set the fill color to the black and fill the whole screen. So, because if you remember, everything between these curly braces in the setup function is something that happens only once when we first start the thing. For these instructions happen in order when we first start the thing. And then everything in this draw function between the curly braces is instructions that happen repeatedly on each new frame of drawing. While everything in this mouse clicked function is things that happen only in the moment immediately following a mouse click. So let's test that. And sure enough, we have uh, a black screen uh, from the beginning. And that means that when we click, we still feel like somehow we're in the same piece. What if we wanted the fill color, the background color here, to change each time we click the mouse? We could put some randomness here. So let's try a random hue from 0 to 100 and a, sure, why not, a random saturation between 0 and 100, and a random brightness. And when I make that go, we start out with our black screen, but when we click, we'll have a different background. And this behavior is intuitive, too, um, because now it's changing every time. So I think that what we had at first, where it changed to black only when we clicked and then it stayed black, that was not so intuitive. It made the first color seem like a little bit of a glitch or an oversight. Now that we've got it that it's changing every time you click, it's just like an extra generative surprising property of this piece. Well, we have lots of other ways we can make this interactive. Um, for example, anywhere we use the expression mouse x or mouse y, that will be equivalent to the current x and y position of the mouse over the canvas. So we could make our um, ellipse width dependent upon where the mouse is. And we could make our ellipse height dependent upon where the mouse y is. Let's give that a try. So right now we're not getting anything because our mouse is not over the canvas. But as soon as I start to get over the canvas, as I move down to the right, we get 
very big circles, and as I move up and to the left, we get little circles. If I move to this corner, and this is kind of fun, it almost becomes like a, an instrument that I can play. I can imagine um, with this instrument that we've got potentially um, VJing to some music, uh, maybe by moving the mouse in time with the music to create video effects that are synchronized with the music. What if we wanted here, I'm going to play the piece again. What if we wanted the circles to get bigger when we went up and to the right? Let's look at the behavior here. As I, when I'm in the top left, the circles are very small. As I go to the right, the circles get bigger. That seems more or less intuitive. As I go down, the circles get bigger, which I guess that's intuitive too, but what if we wanted the opposite behavior? What if we wanted the circles to get bigger as we went up? So when we're at the top of the screen, mouse Y is zero. When we're at the bottom of the screen, mouse Y is however many pixels we have in the canvas, or 600. So if I take 600 and I subtract mouse Y, how's that going to work? Think about these two cases. Mouse Y goes from 0 to 600. Now 600 minus mouse Y. When mouse Y is 0, 600 minus that is going to be 600. When mouse Y is 600, then 600 minus 600 will be 0. So this will be a way of um, flipping the way this works. So let's do mouse Y minus 600 and see how that interaction feels, or if it suggests anything different to us. So now my circles are big when I'm up high, and as they go down, they get smaller. Yeah, I like that better. So I've probably taken about 20 or 25 small steps here. Every time I've been trying it and testing it to see what the result is. Um, and as a result, I've had a fairly um, confident and smooth um, experience starting to generate this piece. If I was making an actual um, piece that I was going to submit, an actual work of media art, I would have to do this for a lot longer, um, not just for 20 minutes. Um, but, but I would employ the same process of slowly making little changes and then trying things, looking at the results, making another change, uh, so on and so forth, rather than making some big elaborate plan, some scheme, and then trying to implement it. Um, if I was to make a big elaborate scheme and then try to implement it, I think that there would be two problems with that. One would be that it might be very difficult. I might set myself a goal that is um, very hard to implement or that um, is a bit of a brain bender, and that could be a frustrating experience. And I think the second consequence is, is that by having an elaborate plan and then trying to implement it, I might be closed off to surprising things um, that the system could give me. Um, for example, right now, I've, I haven't been moving the mouse for very long, and the system has been drawing um, little circles over the larger circles that we drew earlier. And I think it's kind of a, an interesting effect. Um, if I was going to develop this piece further, maybe I would try to make that effect something that was there um, from the start. That's just an idea that's coming to me right now while I'm looking at this. Uh, and so that idea, I don't think, maybe wouldn't come to me if I insisted on having a plan 
or a design in advance that I then have to implement. So this is what we call bricolage programming. And uh, in upcoming lectures, we're going to explore it in several different contexts. Um, it's a uh, powerful way of thinking about working with computers and about um, making generative art. And, and I'm confident um, that we can all do some interesting work with it. All right. Thank you. See you soon.